I'm going to bring Pastor Mike up now, and uh, I'll uh, say a prayer to kick off this uh, meeting. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the spirit that you've given us today. We just pray that any opposing forces will be bound up and slammed to the ground by the power of your, your blood. I thank you for each one that's here today. Many people have made great sacrifice to come here. And I feel a kinship with the people that are in this room because we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And uh, I thank you for the speakers that we have and their desire to deliver the truth to us. So I just pray you'd be with Pastor Mike as he makes his presentation now. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. Let me put this on real quick. All right, there we go. Did you bring a Bible to a Bible prophecy conference? Turn to Psalm 139, if you would. Psalm 139. I appreciate the opportunity, once again, to be here at Red River. Uh, I think this is, I think, the fifth year that I've uh, come here. And I appreciate the ministry. I appreciate the heart of the men who run this conference. They're good men. I love them dearly. And I appreciate them and their long suffering with uh, guys like us who talk about prophecy. We tend to think some weird things sometimes. I'm, I'm one of these, I believe in giants, dragons, and unicorns. Think about it. I believe in giants because Joshua and Caleb saw them and said, we can have them. They'll be bread for us. They're, they're nothing. I believe in dragons because I know who the devil is, and he's a dragon. I believe in unicorns, because, and not the little white with the rainbow horn on its head, stuff like that. But there was a creature who lived thousands of years ago that was a huge monster of a beast with this amazingly large horn coming out of its head. God equated his strength with the power of the unicorn. So I have to believe these things that the Bible tells us. So I believe what the Bible says, and I'm very, very cautious about believing anything else. Uh, Psalm 139, are you there? Say amen. God showed me this verse years ago. And it's going to have everything to do with what I'm going to talk about today. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book, David is saying this to God. He told him in the earlier verse, he said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So he says, in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. And what he's referring to, here we go, 3,000 years ago, um, everything we know about DNA goes back to the 1950s. Most of what we know about DNA is about 20 years old, and so our knowledge of this doesn't go back very far. 
And yet, God knew about it because he wrote it. God is the author of my DNA. Everything that I am, everything that abides in this body, everything that has been or will be is a result of what God spoke in my DNA. So my DNA literally is a book. It's a book where all my members are written. My fingers, my hair, my eyes, my stature, my looks, uh, things that I had in my body when I was five years old that I don't have anymore, like a really cute face, okay? That was in my DNA. And then when I was about 12 or 13 years old, I started to change. I didn't have this boys choir high voice anymore. I got a low one. Started getting hair on my face and my armpits, all right? And I started to smell weird. That was because that was in the DNA. The moment I was conceived, it was written there, but it wasn't time for it yet. So when my body hits 12, 13 years old, then I start changing. So I grow all this hair. Now the older I get, all this hair is leaving. All right, I think it knows death is around the door and we're just, we're not gonna stay around for it. But everything that has happened in my body and everything that has yet to take place already written down in a book called DNA. DNA is an amazing thing to study if you'll study it from the Bible's viewpoint. Because if I believe that God authored my Bible, and I do, then I must believe that God authored a book called DNA. And by the way, DNA is a book of prophecy. Because as you were written out on the day of your conception, you did not have eyes and a head and ears and a heart and skin and everything. You didn't have a liver. You didn't have a brain. You didn't have anything like that. And yet, it was all written down in the DNA, meaning that it was prophesying that at one day it was going to happen. And that's what that verse says. In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So in the moment of your conception, you did not have any of the members of your body, and yet they were all written down in the book, and as time marched on, these members of your body started showing up. Now think about God's Word. On the day of Pentecost, all we have is 120 disciples. We have Mary, the mother of Jesus. We have Peter and the other disciples, and they're there in the other room. And so on the day of Pentecost, those men proclaimed the Word of the Lord. Now all of a sudden, 3,000 people get saved. 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost turning into what may be the hundreds, thousands, or millions of born-again, Bible-believing Christians that have existed since the creation all the way up till now. And I believe there are still more people to be saved. Amen? Still more people that God is going to bring in. So God has already written them out to be saved. Some of them just don't know it yet. But they're going to meet Jesus, amen? And God's going to save them, and they're going to be part of the members of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so, the Bible is a book of prophecy, and it's a sure word of prophecy, and my DNA is a sure word of prophecy, and it is a book that God has written. So I'm going to ask you some questions. Who in here owns land? You own any land? You own a house and land, Okay. With that land, there is a piece of paper. It's called a deed. And on that deed, it defines the parcel of land. There was a survey done. Surveyors came out and mapped out this corner and that corner and all the corners of your property, described your house, whether it was two-story, three-story, single-story, ranch house or whatever, but it defines all of these things and writes it down in the deed. So your property lines the lines of the land that you own are written out in that deed. If I were to ask you, can I have your copy of the deed because I just want to update the language in that, would you trust me? Why? Okay. Well, I mean, I just want to change the line. I just want to update the language a little bit to make it simpler to understand. Would that be okay? Would you trust me to do that? I wouldn't. That deed defines what your property is, and even the Bible said that we're not allowed to remove the old landmarks. 
Just because your neighbor has a well of water right two feet on the other side of his property doesn't mean that you have a right to change your property line in order for you to confiscate that man's well. God foresaw that. God wrote it in the law, and he said, you're not supposed to change the landmarks. That's somebody's property. You don't take that away from them. So I'm going to ask you this. Your DNA is a book that God wrote for you, and it defines everything that you are. Would you allow somebody to go and rewrite parts of your DNA? Don't do it. Because number one, God owns the copyright to your DNA. You believe that? Turn to Revelation chapter 22. If it's a book that God wrote, he has the rights to it. Just as you would not allow somebody to rewrite the deed to your property, the deed to your car, rewrite the terms of a contract that you might have with the bank or a mortgage contract or a rental agreement. You wouldn't allow somebody to rewrite your rental agreement, would you? You pay rent on something. You wouldn't let somebody just come in and arbitrarily just change the details of that lease or that rental agreement. You wouldn't trust anybody to do that. And in fact, it's against the law. If you don't sign off to it, it's not even legal to begin with. Amen? So God writes books. It's what he does. And he holds the copyright to those books. And God expressly forbids anybody from altering even one word of his book. Look at Revelation 22, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Book. Sounds pretty serious. Rule number one, you're not allowed to add one word to the words that are in this book. Rule number two, verse 19, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly, amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. So the one who testifies to this is none other than Jesus himself, the author of the book. And the author of the book says, rule number one, do not add to the words of this book. Rule number two, do not take away from the words of the prophecy of this book. If you take anything away, I'm going to take away your name out of the book of life and out of the holy city, and you get nothing. So, turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Do we have any Jehovah's Witness in the crowd? I wouldn't mind it if there were. I wouldn't mind preaching to them a little while. Amen? The Jehovah's Witness are able to convince their followers that Jesus is not God, and they staunchly believe it. They believe it or else, all right? I used to know a guy that was Jehovah's Witness, and he was scared to death of the elders in his church. They had power over him. And so in the New World Translation of the Bible, all they did to uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, was add one word. That's all they did. And that one word then skews your, your view of who Jesus is throughout the entire Bible. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now take the letter A and add it after the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was. Take the letter A and add it right after the Word was. Now what do you have? Word was A, God. And they believe that Jesus was a lesser created demagogue, lower than God the Father, low enough so that God could use him to create the world and the universe. But the bottom line is they do not believe Jesus 
was the divine son of God. They do not believe he's the everlasting father. They do not believe that the father and the word and the Holy Ghost are one. They do not believe that. And all they have to do is add one word to John chapter one, and then it destroys in the minds of Jehovah's Witness their entire view of who Jesus is just by adding one word. You see how dangerous it is to add to or take away from God's word. The same rules then apply to your DNA. And I mentioned yesterday, this year, 2018, is the year. China's been doing it, and now it's being done in the United States of America. Scientists are creating embryos that they are able to go in and rewrite the DNA of those embryos using the CRISPR DNA editing system. In other words, they look through the DNA, they find something they don't like, they take it out. Or they find something that they think should be added to it, and so they just add it to it, not caring about the results or about what may happen or the fact that they're messing with a book that they did not write. Therefore, see, that's why evolution is so strong in their minds. They believe that books write themselves. That's stupid. Pretend that you've got three billion pieces of paper and you've got one of them old typewriters, you throw it out into a field and you expect that within a hundred million years, a copy of War and Peace will show up out there. Books do not write themselves. Amen? And man does not write Bibles. They come from God himself. Amen? Here's why I'm saying this. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at what the Bible says about the rapture. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, the bodies we inhabit now, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we, right now, in the state that we're in, cannot inherit God's everlasting kingdom. Not in this body. This body has to be done away with. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. What did Jesus say about new wine? Can you put new wine in old bottles? No, because if you put the new wine in the old bottle, the old bottle will burst and you've lost both of it. New wine must be put into new bottles. The new bottle he was talking about, I think is this new body that you and I are going to inherit one of these. Aren't you ready for that one, amen? I mean, I don't feel so great this afternoon and I wouldn't mind for God to give me a completely new body, amen? So look at this. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Because the rapture is as much about a change of location as it is a transformation. We're not just leaving this world in this body to live in heaven in a corrupt body. God won't allow it. So in order for us to inherit heaven and God's kingdom, there must be a transformation. That's what he says. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Don't put new wine into old bottles. So there must be a transformation. We believe that we are going to receive a brand new body when the trumpet sounds, when Jesus appears in the clouds, we are going to be transformed. We are going to be changed. Now, my question was, what about the rest of the world? When we are transformed, does the devil have a plan or a program to change everybody else on this earth at or about the time that we ourselves are transformed and changed by God? And I believe the answer to that is yes. Take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We have here God 
really the first time he's giving a commandment to mankind. He's giving it to Adam himself. And in verse 16 of Genesis chapter 2, the Lord commanded of the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now that's not hard to understand, is it? Out of all the trees that Adam lived amongst in the Garden of Eden, he had access to every single one of them. He could eat of one tree one day, he could eat of another tree another day. He could eat of both trees the same day. He could just go from one tree to the next, eating everything that he wanted. One tree in particular was the tree of life, and God gave Adam access to that tree. Every time Adam ate it, it's like he's rejuvenated. He can live as long as he has access to that tree. I think that our tree of life today is this book. Amen? Where do we get our life from? King James, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Because now let's go to Genesis chapter 3. I preached a message here a while back. We have it available on YouTube. We have it on Sermon Audio. We have it, I think, on DVD called Satan's Greatest Enemy or Satan's Biggest Enemy. From what I can see in the scriptures, the biggest enemy that Satan battles on a daily basis basis is God's Word. He hates God's Word. In fact, the very first time we see Satan in the Bible introduced, the very first thing that he does is attack God's Word. Look at what he does. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He's questioning the authority of God's word. In other words, did God really say these words? Now let me ask you a question. Uh, who was in the furnace of fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Jesus was. How do we know that? How do we know that? Turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Are we sure that it was the Son of God in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I am. I'm 100% positive of it. How do I know that? It's what my Bible says. The world says that it took 13 billion years for us to show up on this earth. I don't believe that. I believe God created man on the sixth day of creation. Instantaneously, God formed man out of the dust of the ground. That's where we came from. I won't argue it. I'm not going to change my mind just because the overwhelming amount of people in the earth don't believe it. I believe it because God said it, and that settles it as far as I'm concerned. So Daniel chapter 3, look in your Bible. And I want you to read verse 25 with me. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like who? The Son of God. Does anybody's Bible say something different? Like a son of the gods. Does your Bible say that? Anybody's Bible say that? If it does, it's wrong. It wasn't a son of the gods with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fiery furnace, was it? It was the son of God. And Nebuchadnezzar knew who it was. He wasn't fooled. So, does it make a difference then? If one Bible says the son of God, and other Bibles say a son of the gods or one of the gods. Does that make a difference? Sure it does. Turn to 1 John. 
chapter 5. Do you believe that there are three in the Godhead? The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit? Where is it that teaches that? It's in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The King James Bible, amongst all the English Bibles that are out there, is the only translation of the Bible that contains 1 John 5, 7. You'll not find it in the New International Version. You'll not find it in the Holman Christian Standard Version, which is the Southern Baptist Bible. You're not going to find it in the English Standard Version. You're not going to find it in the Message Bible. You're not going to find it in any of the, of the New Living Translation. You're not going to find it in any of the modern translations of the Bible. Only the King James Bible. Now, does it matter whether or not 1 John 5, 7 is even in the Bible or not? Does it matter? Remember what we said. Would you allow someone to change the deed to your property? Would you allow someone to take a whole section out of the deed to your property? The answer is no. Would you allow someone to take a paragraph out of a rental agreement, like you live in an apartment or you rent a house from someone? Would you allow your landlord to take out an entire sentence out of your lease agreement behind your back? The answer is no. Deeds cannot be changed that way. Rental agreements cannot be changed that way. Neither should God's word be changed that way as well. So notice the very first thing that Satan says, yea, hath God said. In other words, did God really say this? Because in all these modern Bibles where they have omitted 1 John 5, 7, they put a little note there and says, the earliest and the best manuscripts do not contain 1 John 5, 7. In other words, we don't think that God really said, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Same thing that the devil did in Genesis chapter 3 was question the authority of God's word. Did God really say this? Now look at Eve's response. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Question, did God say that they could not touch it? No. No. Go back and look at Genesis chapter 2. We just read it, verses 16 and 17, and find in there where God said, don't touch it. God never said that. So now here's what we have. We have a setup going here. We have the serpent, who is the devil, questioning God's word. Then we have Eve adding to God's word. This is a recipe for disaster. Think of the two testaments of your Bible. Now let's add the Book of Mormon. Can we do that? No. God said, I don't even want you adding one word, much less an entire ridiculous book called the Book of Mormon. Where did Joseph Smith get that book? An angel from heaven. And Paul said, though we or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. So if I come bringing in here my Old Testament, New Testament, and then something else that I wrote that I said, well, God gave me this. Is that okay? No. Adding to God's word is just as bad as taking away from it. So look at Satan's response. Verse 4. The serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. That is a direct contradiction of what God said. And it's a lie. So he's planning in her mind a new word or a new doctrine. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. Now watch this. 
he's already questioned the authority of what God said. Now he's altered what God said. And it worked. Because his whole plan wasn't just to destroy the authority of God's word or add or take away from God's word. His whole plan was to replace God's word. By what? For God doth know that in day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. His whole plan was to get Eve to eat of the fruit that God specifically said, don't eat. So he destroys God's word, he questions God's word, then he replaces God's word with something else. Who in here has been to a church, and in that service, there was little or no Bible presented during that service. Raise your hand. You still go there? Why? Because if God's word is not present, God is not present. And if God's word is not present, then you know that whatever they're going to do in that service is a replacement for God's word, but it's not going to be God's word. Make sense? That's what the devil is all about. Whether it's replacing this book or replacing our book of DNA. It's not just about, well, we've examined your DNA. You, you, sent, your Goog, you sent your DNA to Google, 23andMe. And Google's figured out what you're made of and where you came from and what you have. Now that's going to sit in a database somewhere and somebody along the way is going to examine your DNA and they're going to say, hmm, it's very interesting. Well, you seem to have some things missing out of your DNA. And so that tells us that more than likely you're going to have some sort of disease creep up on you and it's probably going to kill you. We're going to inform your insurance company that in order for them to keep covering you, they're going to have to deal with the fact that you're going to die in a few years of some disease because we found it missing in your DNA. Or, well, we see some things here in your DNA that um, they're probably going to kill you. They're probably going to turn out bad. You're going to grow an extra arm out of your eye or something like that. And uh, that really doesn't belong there. So we suggest you take it out. Don't do it. You say, well, it's my DNA. And God says, no, it isn't. I wrote it, not you. And I'm the only one who has the copyrights to it. So think about what the devil's doing now with CRISPR, DNA editing, um, genetic restructuring, genetic transformation, whatever title they give it. It's all about getting you to see that the DNA that you have is bad. We have a replacement DNA package for you that when we give it to you, it will wipe away all your diseases. It'll cure all the diseases that you have or will have, and we can see you living to 200, 300, 400, even 500 years. We can do that for you. Turn to, you think that's possible? Turn to... Daniel, turn to Dan. Yeah, can we go to heaven now? Sure. They've mixed some Kool-Aid up for you guys back in the back. Daniel chapter 2, turn there. The devil has a new DNA plan for you. A new package of DNA that God never gave you. If God wanted you to have it, you would have had it. You short people, if God wanted you to be six foot three inches tall, you would have been six foot three inches tall. If he wanted you to be five foot eight, you'll be five foot eight. And that's just how it is. So here the devil has a new DNA package that everybody on the earth is going to take advantage of except God's people. Daniel chapter, there's four kingdoms here. Kingdom of gold, kingdom of silver, kingdom of brass. Then we have the kingdom of iron. That's represented by the legs and the feet. And the toes are not just iron. 
They're iron mingled with miry clay. What did God make us out of? Miry clay. So that the clay represents man. The iron, when you know the numbers, you know what this kingdom is. It's not a kingdom of this earth. The fourth kingdom is principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the kingdom that we're wrestling against right now. And we're to go to war with this. Because they, look at, look at your Bible, Daniel chapter 2, verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of powers clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, for there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, underline this in your Bible, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. The Bible does not have the word deoxyribonucleic acid in it. It does not have the word DNA in it. What it has to explain it is the word seed. Everybody knows what seed is. If you plant, when you put a pumpkin seed in the ground, you're hoping to get what? Pumpkin. Tomato seeds, you're hoping to get tomatoes. Because inside that seed are packages of DNA. We know that. We know that every seed, whether it's a, whether it's a vegetable seed or, as with us humans, the men and the ladies, both carry bundles of their DNA in the reproductive system. And when the man and the woman come together, she has 23 chromosomes, he has 23 chromosomes, they're added together to make 46, and the seed then becomes from the male and the female, and we all, I don't have to explain it any further, we know what that is. It's our DNA. So look at your Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about the, the rapture. How does he describe it? But some, will, some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. So whatever body you have right now, that's the body that God intended. It pleased, since the seed was written by God, then the results are from God. And your body, for better or for worse, whether you have really good DNA or you've got some challenges in your day, DNA, either way, God is the one who gave that to you. God is the one who has the right to do anything with it never belongs to man, and it never should belong to the devil. Um, 1 Corinthians 15 again, it's about change. We shall be changed. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. See, the rapture is about transformation. But the devil also has a transformation ready. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. I want you to see this in your Bible. I'm going to read Philippians 3.20. For our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. 1 Peter 1, 23, Being born again. How many of you are born again? Say amen. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth for. Ever. So if you ask me what I believe about my Bible, I believe that my Bible is incorruptible. Meaning the devil cannot change God's word. Amen? Not only has it not been corrupted, it cannot be corrupted. And it's alive and it abides with me every single day we're not just talking about some piece of paper with ink on it we're talking about something that is alive and it abides with us every single day 
and the devil. And he tries every day. Chris Pinto provided some really good information here last year about the devil's attack through the Vatican on the Bible translation issue. He still got that at his table. Take it, but pay for it first. But take it home, okay? Because you're going to understand then the background of what I'm saying to you today. The devil hates the seed of God. Let me, in fact, let me show you why. Turn, to, turn back to Genesis chapter 3. Do you remember um, how God cursed the serpent? And what he said to him. Let's see if I, yeah. Genesis 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. What did we say seed was in the Bible? DNA. Notice that there is warfare, there's enmity between the devil's seed and the woman's seed. The devil's DNA and the woman's DNA. He hates the Bible. He hates the book that God wrote. And one of those books is DNA. The other book is my Bible. Look up at the screen. Is it possible? We know that we are born again by incorruptible seed by the word of God. It wasn't the words of the preacher that saved us. It was the word of God that saved us. Do we, is it possible then that there is another born again experience from corruptible seed? Look at that verse. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. Look at Matthew 23. The words of the scribes and the Pharisees have the ability to make a person twofold more the child of what? Hell. Wow. You see, the first time we're born, we're already children of hell. When you're born, you're going to hell. Amen? You must be saved to avoid that. Someone then who is twofold for the child of hell they're never going to be saved. They're already doomed. Jude chapter 1 verse 12 refers to the false prophets and the false teachers as twice dead. Meaning, they have already gone from the first death to the, they're already the inheritors of the second death. Meaning, that while they teach their false doctrines, you're not going to win an argument with them and they're going to repent and be saved. They're already doomed and they're going to hell. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 38, But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. So the seed is what makes the body. What is it that makes the body of Christ? This. Who in here was saved by the Bible? Then we're brothers and sisters. Because we have the same DNA. We have the same father. So, if the DNA or the Bible that you converted to, if that is not the same as this Bible, then we're not brothers. We're not of the same family because we have different DNA we have a different father. Remember what Jesus told those Pharisees? Ye are of your father, the devil. God talked about in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the serpent, the offspring of the serpent, the DNA of the serpent, was at odds in war against the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman. The DNA and the seed make a difference. Now take your Bible, turn to Matthew 13. Is it possible that wheat and tares will live together for all of eternity in heaven? No. Who sowed the tares? 
It says right here, the enemy. Verse 25, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. We know that the good seed is the word of God. The tares is whatever the devil came up with to replace the word of God. So, verse 26, but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, What thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Something happens at harvest. Something transforms both the wheat and the tares at harvest so you can tell them apart. I'm going to show you that. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye first the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, uh, then he, in Matthew, later on, he explains the good seed are the children of the kingdom and the tares are the children of who? The wicked one. So we're talking about two nations, aren't we? Two types of people. And they're not related because they have different fathers. One group is the children of God himself. God is our father. The other group is the children of Satan himself. He is their father. They have his seed, his DNA in them. Now look at this. Verse 41, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Verse 43, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun. I'm smiling because I know what I'm going to show you, and it's neat. The righteous shall shine forth as the sun. You know who the sun is? Jesus. The Bible says in Malachi chapter 4, the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wing. Psalm 19 says that the sun goes out of his chamber like a bridegroom out of his chamber. The bridegroom is Jesus. It's the sun. He is the light of the world, he said. And there's something about the wheat that when it's harvested, it shines at uh, the righteousness of the sun. Now, Take a look up on the screen. I have wheat and I have, the word for it now is poison darnel. That's what it's called, poison darnel. That's tares. Which is which? Can you tell? Huh? My left or your left? My left. You say that's the wheat, that's the tares. Could be. Could be. Would you be willing to bet your farm on it? Your car? Your wife? Who in here would bet their soul that one of that the picture on this side is the wheat? No takers. I wouldn't. And that's what Jesus said. We can't harvest them now. We can't pull the tares out because there is a good chance you're going to make a mistake. You're going to take the wheat and burn it. God's not going to let any of us burn. Amen? So there's something about the harvest that transforms them. Now, I have two books up here called Holy Bible. One of them is different than the other. One of them says things different than the other one. One of them has 64,000 less words than the other. Are they the same? They look the same. Can we tell the difference? Now look, which one's the wheat? You were right. Okay, you could have bet me a million dollars. I have to owe it to you, okay? Look at what color the wheat is. Same color as the sun, isn't it? Isn't that neat? 
He said they shall shine with the righteousness of the Son. We're going to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, and he's the Son of righteousness. Amen. You know what happens to poison Darnell? Let me tell you why it's called poison Darnell. It's poisonous. There's a fungus that grows on that seed. It's the only place where it grows. And it's an intoxicant that when you ingest that seed with that fungus on it, number one, it'll make you delirious like a drunkard, and then it will kill you. Now you think about this. Think about how God designed this. His word will always make you right and clean and sober. And you'll think sober. Is it important to be sober in these days? Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Wait a minute. I thought Jesus was the lion. He's the roaring lion, the lion of Judah, in Revelation chapter 5. So if Satan is a roaring lion and Jesus is a roaring lion, how can I tell the difference? You can't if you're drunk. If you're sober, you'll be able to know the difference. You believe that? So the poison Darnell transforms at harvest. It's no longer green. It turns black as night. Think about it. Darkness. We wrestle against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. God's showing us that. Here's what I'm getting at. There is coming a time that there's going to be a transformation. Number one, there's going to be a transformation of God's people and we're going to look like Jesus looks. Amen? They're going to look like their father looks. Dark. Sinful, evil. They're going to be transformed as well at the harvest. A change is coming. Now look up on the screen. The Bibles that I put up there, now you can tell the difference. Daniel 3.25 on the wheat side calls the fourth in the fiery furnace the Son of God. Daniel 3.25 in the New International Version calls him a son of the gods. Who is that? The son of the gods, the Antichrist. It's not Jesus. So which one is in your Bible? That's your DNA. Okay? But he answered and said, every plant, look at this. A brother showed me this before I came out here to talk, and I said, I'm going to use that verse. Matthew 15, 13, underline this in your Bible. Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Planted as in seed. If God didn't say it, then God didn't grow it. It's not God's plant. Remember what Jesus said? I am the true vine. Deuteronomy 32 talks about the vine of Sodom. They're not the same. What kind of fruit do you think the vine of Sodom produces? Sodomy. Brother showed me a, a newsletter from the Evangelical Lutheran Church, which apparently is strong in this area. The writer of that article, there was a, a man who wrote a letter to the editor of that magazine and said, I'm a sodomite, I'm a gay man, and I'm so glad that the Evangelical Lutheran Church accepts us in the LGBT community. If they do, it's because they're from the vine of Sodom and not the true vine, Jesus Christ. Do you agree to that? Look at this, chicken embryos with dinosaur snouts created in a lab. If God wanted chickens to have dinosaur lips, he would have given them to them. Man says we're going to add to God's word. Potato made with gene editing. I wouldn't eat it. Amen? We have genetically modified humans now. Where they've rewritten the DNA of these humans. See what happens? They become the child of the devil. You're of your father the devil. 
I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed. And remember, seed is DNA. So the DNA matters. Look at, now we have genetically modified churches. You believe that? What's the DNA of the church? Whatever word they regard as authority. If they regard the word of God as authority, then God is their father. But if they accepted some other seed, then God is not their father. The devil is. How do we get genetically modified churches? Different DNA. Where did all these other Bible translations come from? Did they come from the same source as what underlines the King James, the old Spanish reign of Valeria, and countless other translations from the Textus Receptus or the majority text, the majority manuscript of Greek documents is a different line than the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus where almost all new translations come from. Chris Pinto has got videos on his table about this issue and he does a way better job explaining it than I do about the source of these Greek texts that underlie these new translations but they are not the same vine as what underlies the King James and if they're not the same seed then they will produce different fruit and they have a different father take a look at this picture here is the editing committee for the modern Greek New Testament. You have men like Kurt Aland, men like Brutz Metzger. These are names that I learned in Bible college. I didn't know who they were till I got this. I stole this from Chris, so if you don't like it, blame him. Here's what one of the editors of these modern Greek New Testaments that underlie these modern translations. Here's what Kurt Aland said. If the epistles were really written by the apostles whose names they bear and by the people who were closest to Jesus, then the real question arises, was there really a Jesus? This is a man who gives you the Greek New Testament of these new Bibles. Can Jesus really have lived if the writings of his closest companions were filled with so little of his reality, so little in them of the reality of the historical Jesus? He wasn't sure if Jesus was real. He said, we observe, when we observe this, assuming that the writings about which we're speaking really come from their alleged authors, it almost appears as if Jesus were a mere phantom and that the real theological power lay not with him, but with the apostles of the early church. In other words, Christianity is not built upon Jesus. It's built upon men. That was Kurt Alon's idea of it. Here's what Bruce Metzger said. He said, the books of Moses were derived from a matrix of myth, legend and history you know who the bible says wrote the books of moses take a guess moses bruce metzger didn't believe that he believed that they were a collection of myths and legends but not the word of god so he said these appeared as early as the time of david and solomon but that later in modified form became part of scripture he didn't believe the bible and yet Jesus said, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed in me. So if you don't believe Moses, you don't believe in Jesus. Now what are these two men doing, forming the basis, the DNA, of all these new modern translations of the Bible, the DNA of the new churches? Here's Metzger with Pope Paul. Here's Metzger with Pope John Paul. Here's Kurt Alon with both popes. And then we have another guy. We have Carlos Martini. He's right here. See my little red dot? You see a little red dot? Is it up there? There we go. See these guys are all wearing white shirts and ties? He's not. You know why? Because in his line of work, they don't wear ties. He's a Jesuit priest. Sitting on the committee that's rewriting the DNA of all the churches now. So if we've got three men who are in bed with the Vatican, who are the ones that are writing the DNA of all the modern churches with all these modern Bibles, something's not right. Would you trust, again, 
Would you trust any of these men to write a Sunday school lesson for your church? Absolutely not. Then why do we trust them to form the Greek New Testament of these new Bibles? I'm talking about the NIV, the New American Standard, the Revised Standard Version, the New English Version, the Message Bible, and Holman Standard Bible. All of these new Bibles are the new DNA, which is why you see one church after another fall at the feet of Sodom. Have I made my message clear? Let me show you how do I change the DNA of our church? All you have to do is give them a different Bible. This verse, Matthew 17, 21, Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. That verse is missing out of all the modern Bibles. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. That verse is missing out of all the modern translations of the Bible. Mark 7, 16, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. That verse is missing. Mark eleven twenty six. 26, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. That verse is missing. Mark 15, 28, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. That verse is missing. Mark 9, 44, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. That, those verses are missing. Matthew 9, 13, But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The latter part of that verse has been omitted. For I do not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And then they omit the rest of it. Matthew 10, uh, 20, 22, But Jesus answered and said, You know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? That part of that verse has been taken out in the New Bibles. Matthew 27, 35, that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they did cast lots. They took that out. Acts 8, 37, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Because he asked, What must I do to be baptized? And Philip told him, You must believe. Because we don't believe that just baptizing somebody saves them, do we? So the church that believes that must have got it from these new Bibles. Because that verse has been taken out. 1 John 5, 7, There are three that bear reckoning in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That verse is missing. Every modern English translation of the Bible has taken that out. I want to show you one more thing. I'm going to be done, Tim. Give me uno momento, por favor. How's my Spanish? No habla, huh? Uh, this will shake you. In the King James Bible, the word hell is given 54 times. If you want to know anything about hell, you can go to a King James Bible and find it. Things like where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Things like place of outer darkness. Things like the wicked are turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. That's the Bible defining for you who goes to hell and what it is and how long it lasts. In the NIV alone, out of 54 occurrences of the word hell, you're only going to find the word hell 13 times in an NIV. Every other place, they've replaced it with words such as the grave, Hades, or realm of the dead. Now, my question to you is, does it matter what Bible you believe? Because the seed determines the creature and the body. And the reason why you see so many churches turning south is because of this issue on the Bible. The reason why we see our country plunging into hell is because the DNA of our country, which was the Bible, is no longer the DNA and the foundation of our nation anymore. Do you believe that? This is a, something that is very dear to my heart. And I can't go anywhere but what I mention something about God's Word. Because it means... Every 
thing. It determines where you're going to spend eternity. Father in heaven, I thank you, God, for the brethren that reminded me of this. I thank you, Father, for allowing me to say these things. I thank you, Father, for these that have gathered and have given me an audience to at least hear me out. Father, I can't change their mind like you couldn't change, or like people couldn't change my mind. It had to be you. You, I ask you, Father, to say to them, let there be light. And they'll have light. So, Father, I don't want anybody to change anything just on my say-so. Father, I'm asking you to change minds and hearts, and change men's lives. And Father, make them part of your glorious body when you come to appear in the clouds. Thank you, Father, for this word. Bless it in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Brother Tim, God bless you.